Good morning. Welcome to Church at Home. We're so glad that you have joined us today. We're going to have a fantastic morning of being able to worship together, to hear Dave speak another message out of our Essentials series. But before we get there, would you give me a few moments just to be able to celebrate the Living Waters community? Months ago, we all asked the question, how would the church do in the midst of the pandemic? How would the church continue to be the church? Well, I want to celebrate today that Living Waters is not just surviving, it's actually thriving. Let me give you a few examples. Two weeks ago, we had a family drive through so that families could drive through and pick up boxes just like this one uh, to be able to help their kids engage uh, with church. And this box had lots of wonderful things in it, uh, different resources, craft supplies, uh, different things to be able to be part of the kids' ministry. In fact, I thought it had some Valentine's Day chocolates in here, but they seem to be gone. Weird. I wonder what my kids did with that. Anyway, almost 50 families have picked up these boxes and, and been able to engage with church because of them. That shows signs of life. So good. Last night, our church participated in the coldest night of the year. Over 40 people raised over $4,500 by walking through their own communities in support of Salvation Army's Gateway of Hope. What a wonderful way for us to reach out into our local community and be a part there. And another way Living Waters is definitely alive is through our life groups. Since September, we've had 45 people asked to be part of life groups and we've been able to connect them into a life group. That's the equivalent of almost five life groups being started since then. That's almost one every month since then. We have over 300 adults engaged with life groups. Uh, that means every week, adults around the Langley area have been gathering together in smaller groups on Zoom, being able to pray together, care for each other, and love each other. Living Waters, we're thriving as a community, and so thank you for being willing to continue to be the church, even when it's hard to do church the way that we used to. So, as we go into worship now, Let's go with a heart of celebration that God is doing good things in and through us and in our community. Let's worship together. Worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what the Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, oh hero of heaven. You conquered the grave, you free every captive and break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. You've been faithful through every storm, you'll be faithful forevermore, you have done great things. I know you will do it again For your promise is yes and amen You will do great things God, you do great things Oh, hero of heaven You conquered the grave You free every captive And break every chain of Above it all, hallelujah, God, unshakable 
conquered the grave You free every captive and break every chain Oh God, you have done great We dance your freedom, awake and alive Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high Oh God, you have done great for me Love's like a hurricane I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by your glory and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me and oh and how he loves us so oh how he loves us how he loves us so
Today's scripture is from Colossians 1, 15 to 20. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Hi friends, uh, my name is Dave and I'm on the pastoral team here at Living Waters and happy to be sharing today I first want to begin, though, by sharing an invitation with you. This will be the first time it's announced, and so we want you to to hear and mark it on your calendar. We're setting aside lunch hours during the month of March on Wednesdays, Wednesday lunch hours, to come together for a time of prayer, praying specifically about needs within our community and needs that will be shared each week. Encourage you to come join myself, and Ryan, and Kirsten, and Lynn, and Luke, and Doug will be there each week uh, to pray and to lift up the needs within our community. So come when you can and leave when you need to between the hours of 12.30 and 1.15 during the five Wednesdays in the month of March. You can head over to our website uh, to hear more about this. So today we uh, continue in our fourth week in our essential series We've talked about creation for two weeks, and now we're talking about Jesus. We're talking about Jesus. At the end of our street in Walnut Grove, we have some really, really big, tall evergreen trees. They're tall. They go way up in the sky. And it was windy last week. And as I've seen before, these big, big, tall trees swaying in the wind and you'll wonder what's gonna happen. I found myself just last week asking myself the same questions I used to ask when I was really young at our cottage when the storm would come off the lake and these big trees would topple and toss in the strong winds. The question I'd always ask is, how do these really tall trees not fall during the storm? So last week, I went through the same exercise I went through since I've been a little little kid, noticing that the greatest turbulence is at the very top of these tall trees. And the more you you move down the center of the tree, the less movement there is to a point, of course, where the trunk and the ground intersect. There's actually very little evidence of the storm. Of course, the root system or healthy root systems in place secure the tree even though it gets moved around in the midst of fierce winds. Perhaps this essential series is much like ensuring that our personal root system is in place. For certainly in a day like this, where there is so much uncertainty, with so many ideas being tossed around, 
so many things being seemingly moving around, what can we be certain of and what is essential for faith and spiritual growth? For this is certainly not a time to plateau, it's a time to grow. And this essential series is perhaps enabling some of that. Perhaps when everything out there is uncertain, it's possible for everything in here to be okay and growing. So we're discovering in this essential series that questions about creation and Jesus have existed for a really long time. I once heard it said, there are no right answers to the wrong questions. So we have to get our questions right so we can get our answers right. And this essential series is meant to help with this. Over the last three weeks, we've been asking the right questions about the goodness of God. In the book of Genesis, God stated that what he made was good and furthermore declaring that what is what the earth was made for was good and, and everything on the earth was made to benefit from God's goodness. A popular writer says it this way, this creation that God majestically called forth into being is good. It's good in its individual parts and it's good as a whole, as an integrated system. In fact, in this integrated cosmic sense, the text from Genesis 1 informs us that God declared it all to be very good. However, as much as God seems to have communicated this clearly in word and deed, repeatedly in history, people have questioned God's goodness. And it's, again, it's been like this from the very beginning. Let's follow a bit of that narrative back to the beginning. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, we see the recording of the first question in the Bible asked about God's goodness. It reads this way. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Behind this question is entertaining a lie that prevails still today. The questions are many. Here's, here's, here's a few. Will, will God come up short in his dealing with people? And secondly, is a lie that asks, is God withholding his goodness as we look around? Friends, these questions, again, you got to get the questions right to get the right answers. These questions sow doubt that people maybe can't trust God. And entertaining these ideas and questions will cause people to wander and to get involved in all kinds of relationships and activities, to discover a form of non-permanent goodness outside of a relationship with God. And it's been like that since the very beginning of time. A few verses later in this same chapter, Genesis Chapter 3, God asks Adam a question. It's stated this way in verse 9, Then the Lord God called to Adam, Where are you? This question that God asks is a good question because it speaks as much about the character of God as it does about the character of Adam and Eve. We see in this question a God who is inviting asking, offering, suggesting, God asking, where are you? I have all this for you. How is your life going? How are you experiencing the goodness of God? Where are you in this narrative? We see here a, a God that cares enough to ask. The question, are you receiving this goodness that I have for you? Well, the answer to the question in Genesis is, is primarily no. And again, it's based upon Adam and Eve's and, and other families' choices. So you follow the narrative in Genesis 4 and Genesis chapter 5, bringing us uh, to see a bunch of wandering people 
um, trying to find, again, goodness in a very non-permanent way. The story leads to Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, written this way. The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. So the Lord was sorry he had ever made them, and he put them on the earth, and it broke his heart. Again, this, this narrative is as much about God's character as it is about Adam and Eve's and other families' compromise. Verse 6, chapter 6, says God was moved to pity. He was sorry. He had compassion. God was sorry. In the same way you and I would look at a very desperate situation and say, I feel so sorry for you. For God knowing what he has to offer and observing what people are settling for, such a contrast, he says, I'm so sorry. My goodness is not being received. The sorry we read about in Genesis 5 is the same sorry that Jesus carried in his heart in the New Testament. Mark 8, recording about Jesus. Jesus feeling compassion for the people. Luke 19, when Jesus approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and he wept over it, saying, If you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace. Genesis 11, Jesus wept. The sorry we read in Genesis 5 is the same sorry that Jesus felt when he was on earth, and it's the same sorry that God still has in his heart for people today. Friends, it is essential that we never lose sight of the truth that God's greatest interest is that you and I experience and benefit from God's goodness. It's essential. This is the gospel. God wants his goodness at the center and to have his great love clearly received and understood. And so God cared enough to come himself. That's the story of Jesus. God coming himself. This is the gospel. God coming himself to bring his goodness. As Ryan said last week, if you want to know who God is or what is on God's mind and what is in God's heart, there's Jesus right there. There's Jesus. Take a look. Listen and consider Jesus, the image of the invisible God. So to our text that Reuben read just a few minutes ago, it answers the why and how questions about Jesus in three ways that I'd suggest today. Number one, why Jesus? So God could be here. Number two, why Jesus? So God could reconcile. And number three, why Jesus? So God could offer peace. Let's take a look. Why Jesus? So God could be here on earth. Verse 19 of chapter one of Colossians says, for God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. Friends, God brought all of himself. God brought all of his goodness in bodily form to earth. Jesus, in full view. So there is now no need for so many unanswered questions and mysteries about who God is. When we see Jesus, we see a God who's all in, never withholding any form of goodness. Think about the narratives in the gospel. We see a goodness that was demonstrated where God, we see Jesus, always paying close attention to the matters at hand. We see God, Jesus, on the Sea of Galilee, calming a storm, in a home with a sick person, standing beside someone who's very guilty and offering grace in the temple with religious leaders who completely miss the point, the patience being demonstrated, identifying Jesus, identifying with human loss and grief. We see Jesus on full display, hanging until his death on a Roman cross, and then, of course, standing outside the empty tomb in resurrected form. Jesus, 
the image of the invisible God. So why Jesus? So God could be here. Number two, why Jesus? So God could reconcile everything. Colossians 1.20 says, and through him, Jesus, God reconciled everything to himself. This is further explained by Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. God made him, Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him, Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. Well, how could Jesus be sin for us? While on the cross, Jesus is treated as the wicked deserve to be treated. Jesus bore the trial, the judgment, the punishment, and curse of sin. The wage of sin is death. So there is no getting around the cross or death. Jesus died for the atonement or acquittal of the sins of all mankind, yours and mine. That's the gospel. Why is this so necessary? Because God carries a vision to reconcile all things to himself through Christ. And God's very own death makes this completely possible. So, important question naturally comes up. So how is this going? How is this plan unfolding? Colossians says, through him, God reconciled everything to himself. How is that going? If God reconciled all things, why are things the way they are in the world in 2021? For only parts, it seems, of the world are reconciled. Why are there certain aspects and gaps in this plan and this story? Well, Ricky said it wisely a number of weeks ago. God is not done. God's plan is still in full play. The word Paul uses here is reconcile everything. Everything. The word everything carries a vision, a preferred vision of how things could be. It's a preferred vision. It's a visionary term. Reconciling everything. This word Everything means one appropriate piece at a time. So today, we see the work of God far from finished in this world. The contrast we, between what we see of, of what is good and what is not good points to the vision that God has for to make everything reconciled to himself. That creates hope. That creates purpose that reminds us of this plan that God has. So we see some Christians and non-Christians in the same world. We see the blessing that generosity can be in the world, and in the same world, we see how greed affects all people. We see blessing that honors, we see the blessing that honor can be, and the burden of disgrace that dishonor can be. We see the contrast of those free and those enslaved. Peace versus war, sickness versus death, life versus death and lack of health. The contrast of love and hate in this world. The word everything means God reconciling one piece at a time. God's not done yet. One conversation at a time, one generous act at a time one person at a time, one family at a time, one neighborhood at a time, one church at a time, one province at a time, one country at a time, one people group at a time. Why Jesus? So he could reconcile everything to himself. And lastly, why Jesus? So God could offer peace. Colossians 1.20 said, he made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. God has made peace. We didn't make it. God made it. And that is to be duly noted. It is essential that we understand that. God made peace. So what does that mean? Because of Jesus' work of reconciliation, God now says, I'm good. I'm good. I've made peace 
And so now God invites us to come get that peace. This is the gospel. This is the good news. For whoever will come will receive. This is good news for today. It's now up for the world to come and get that peace. Perhaps you've um, benefited or paid it forward at a Starbucks drive-thru. I've been the recipient and the giver of that random act of kindness at a Starbucks drive-thru. You know how it works. You you, uh, pay it forward for the person that's behind you in the drive-thru line. Uh, When I uh, benefited from it, I was quite surprised to pull up to the server at the window and to hear the server say, you're good. Your uh, bill has been paid. Wow, what a, what a surprise, what a joy to get what has your name on it, but to know someone paid the bill. In this passage in Colossians, God is saying, I'm good. And because I'm good, you can be good. You just have to come and get it. And this is what Jesus has done. By paying the debt of our sin, he made peace. We didn't make it. We benefit from it. This is the gospel. This is the witnessing that needs to happen all over the world. For God is not some angry, resentful God. God says, I'm good. I'm good. I've made peace. And I'm just really sorry that more don't benefit from my goodness. It would be so much better if everyone did. So this peace, this shalom, is about peace inside. This is essential. Peace on the inside. God gives perfect peace. Practically, it means profound psychological, emotional, and spiritual peace to those who steadfastly set their minds on Jesus. If you have an absence of peace, if you have an absence today of shalom, Jesus says, hey, I'm good. I offer you my goodness today. Why don't you come receive it? I give generously. Peace is about in here and peace is about out there. Where all the storms happen and things blow and things move around. See, peace with God and peace from God give us the resources to maintain unity and love with others by continually offering forgiveness and patience. That's Jesus. Peace experienced is multidimensional and it speaks of complete well-being, physically, psychologically, socially, and spiritually, all things being put right with God. See, this is God's vision. He's not done yet. His vision is for everything on earth, One at a time, receiving peace, shalom, all creation, all culture, all relationships, and in every heart, there would be the goodness of God. So take a a walk with me just for a moment and imagine the difference the peace of God would make in the world today. Walk with me just, just for a few minutes through your neighborhood. Walk with me along the, your, the, the workstation or the people that come to your mind when you think about those that are in your community. We'll walk with me uh, now to the hospital, to the rehab center, to the police station. Walk with me to the courthouse, to the food bank. Take a look with, with me on your, your news feed, on your phone today, And ask yourself the question, wow, what difference would the peace of God make in this world today? The shalom of God. Friends, this this is important. This is essential that we carry in our hearts the hope of the gospel, which is that everything would know of the goodness of God. This is essential for us to carry this in our hearts for Christian hope to continue to rise, for Christian passion to remain in place for witness and sharing, 
for maintaining a heart to serve and a conviction and a commitment for local and global ministry so that the world would know of the goodness of God. St. Augustine prayed this, Lord, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. Yeah, there's a restlessness. Often there's a restlessness in here. And there's certainly a restlessness out there. So we pray, come Lord Jesus, come. Bring your peace, bring your shalom, bring your goodness. Come Lord Jesus, come. In just a moment, our worship team is going to lead us in uh, some beautiful prayerful songs. Just before uh, they come, I, I want us to, to go back to that first question that I mentioned a little bit earlier. The first question that God ever asked of someone back in the Garden of Eden. And the, and the question was, was stated this way to Adam. And perhaps as sons of Adam, we can ask the question today as well. God says, where are you today? Where are you? And again, as we've heard, the question carries with it a, a, a bit more of a broader context. Where, where are we at in experiencing the goodness of God? And I pray today for you and for our community at large, this is essential that we would experience the goodness of God in here and the goodness of God out there. So as we sing and as we pray today, may you allow the Holy Spirit, the good Holy Spirit, to help us move all of our thoughts together towards the one who is most important today, and that's Jesus. Why Jesus? Because God is here. Why Jesus? So that God could reconcile all things. Why Jesus? so that we could have peace today for his glory and for our good benefit. Jesus, we love you. Oh, how we love you. You are the one. Jesus, we love you. Oh, how we love you. You are the one our hearts adore. And all things have passed away. Your love has stayed. Breathing in life again, you cause your sun to shine on darkest night. From all that you've done, we will pour out our love. This will be our anthem song. Jesus, we Jesus, we 
Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. I just wanted, before we ended, to share about a few pieces of church news. The first is, is that this last Wednesday was the beginning of the season of Lent. And if you want to participate in this, you are welcome to do so still. You don't have to start with day one. And we have lots of information and resources on our website, so I'd encourage you to check that out. And this is such a good way to prepare our hearts for Easter. Another thing that is happening this week is we have another GROW session this Thursday at 7 p.m. And Luke Danderon is gonna be sharing more with us about the Kwantlen Nation. So you're welcome to join for that. And I wanted to give a special invitation to the women in our community. 
Next Sunday on February 28th, we are going to be having a Zoom gathering from seven to eight, and I would love to invite you to join us. This is gonna be a time where we are going to have some worship, we're going to have some breakout sessions so that we can connect with each other and pray for each other. And I am really looking forward to sharing what I love about our women's network and what some of my hopes are for us moving forward, how we can grow together. If you have never come to a women's network event, this would be a great introduction and we would love to see you there. So if you want more information, you can check to our website. And we also have a Women's Network Facebook page that you can join and you can find out more information there. Thanks so much for joining us today. As we end, I wanna end with one of my favorite promises. Jesus says that he will never leave or forsake us. And I love that that is true, whether I can feel God's presence or not. And so I pray that you would go into your week knowing that Jesus is with you each and every day. Have a great week.